Hello, this is Peyton Fairbanks, and today we're going over real estate horror stories. These videos are typically a little bit longer to make it so that you can probably listen to these on a drive or something like that, but the goal of all this is, is just showing you all the different experiences that you can have in real estate. A lot of people in history have hidden and made it seem like real estate's this big old mysterious thing, and it's really not, but nowadays people treat real estate as if it's just as simple as buying a wholesale house and selling it and making $10,000. And that's not the truth either. So the point of this channel is just to make it so that everybody can kind of understand the ins and outs of real estate and what's a good real estate agent, what's a situation where you should not use a real estate agent or answering any of those questions in general. But real estate horror stories number three, I'm running out. So if you do have any real estate horror stories, I'd really love it if you'd send it to PeytonFairbanks at gmail.com or text me it or whatever and whatnot. I really do enjoy doing this one. It's one of my more enjoyable sections, I feel like. So send in your stories, but... Other than that, let's get right on into it. We're pulling all the stories off of Reddit today, so let's start with Kegman83. Anyone have some incompetent realtor horror stories? Just happened to me the other day. I was showing a house to an investor looking to flip it. The selling agent went on and on about how all the fixes in the house were cosmetic, and it was a sure thing. Luckily for me and my investor, this wasn't my first rodeo. The realtor pointed out that all the cracks in the drywall could be fixed, all the diagonal cracks that is, which is a huge indication of foundation issue, of a foundation issue. I go inside and sure enough there's a nice fat crack in the slab. Also the chimney is clearly separating from the house. The tenant says that it's been like that since 1994 Northridge earthquake and the owner refuses to fix it. I talked to the tenant br briefly about some of the visible termite damage. She said it's been like that for 15 years and had been getting worse every year. She told me that she doesn't even go to that part of the house anymore. I had to sit the agent down afterwards and explain the situation to her. She couldn't understand why everyone was pulling their offers upon inspection. Nowhere in the MLS listing did she indicate structural problems or severe termite damage. I think I just ruined her day. Like, ah, this one's a hard one because the tenant could be just saying stuff because they don't want to move out. You see that all the time where the tenant really says just some gnarly stuff about it. But this is also stuff that you can have an inspector look at and create solutions to. Now, a foundation crack, absolutely. You should be really concerned about that. And there's some structural tests that you might want to be doing on that. That one you should definitely be checking. But a termite inspection, they cost like 75 or 125 bucks. It could have been termite damage, but maybe it isn't. You know, I, I'm not a termite inspector, and I don't typically think most people know what termite damage looks like. Now, if they saw some of those termite like mud tubes going up to it, that's a pretty easy indicator that it's a that the termite damage. So if they had that, you know, maybe for sure. But other than that, I mean, chimney pulling away from the house, that's going to cost a lot of money to fix. That is a huge indicator on why you'd want to back out. But it's just interesting because it sounds like they're really trying to make everybody understand how skilled they are and this isn't their first rodeo. And all these problems are real, but they're getting this information from a tenant. So, yes, happy they backed out. They probably should have backed out. All these problems are really big. They probably don't know as much as they're acting like they know because these are all problems that anybody could really see. Um... Take that as you will. You know, I don't know. Going on to the next one, though. This is another agent one. So I arrived... Oh, Eric1233. So I arrived at a showing, went outside to get all the lights turned on, and went upstairs. I suddenly hear the claws of a large dog standing up and rushing towards me, towards the door and barking. I immediately turn around and run towards the door and lock, unlock it and close it behind me. Right as I'm walking to my car, a bit shaken, I hear the door open behind me, and the guy comes out with the shotgun in hand. It turns out the owner had forgotten to let the renter know that there was a showing today at that time. After he called the owner and got everything figured out, my client decided to skip that house. <laughs> so, two things on this. One, there's a lot of stuff at showings that people forget a showing, that they just don't even care about a showing, or, you know, maybe a tenant's angry about it. And so, I've, had, I've heard of other agents walk in on people that are having sex or... I walked in on a client that had coronavirus when we gave him like a two month warning or like a one week warning is more realistic. And we go in there, we knock, 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 knock. We go inside. We're like, Hey, we're coming inside. Nobody's there. Mind you, this is a confirmed showing. So we're like, okay, we go inside, we're walking around and then we open a door and somebody in there is coughing and they're like, I've got coronavirus. Get out of here. And, and I, we were like, why didn't somebody, there's like three people in the house that just didn't respond. It was it was super crazy, and my client was like freaking out because it was the coronavirus during the height of the pandemic. So, really weird. Um, 
people walking out with shotguns or misunderstandings of when showings are, it, it happens really quite often. But then the next thing is, is that people that leave like barking dogs in their house or the people that have a bad experience when they're going and doing a showing, you immediately lost them as a possible buyer. And so that's something I always tell people is like, if there's something that's going to make somebody uncomfortable looking at your house, like the sellers hanging around the house or a barking dog or anything like that, get rid of it. Because you want to take out all opportunities for somebody to look at the house and be like, mm, no, I probably don't want to do that. Now, so I'll quit blabbering so much, but now my Evanston listing, I've got sellers there that's got a really quiet dog. And the really quiet dog went back into her kennel. You could shut the kennel and she was in the back of the garage. She's super quiet, not barking, not angry, just sitting there. I mean, that is much different than having a barking dog in the middle of your living room. So, you know, sometimes you do got to accommodate to people, but just do your best to take away as many distractions as you can while you're showing homes or if you're listing a home. But I digress. Keep on going. Keep on trucking. But so it stops recording after every five minutes, and sometimes I forget about that, and uh, um, now i got to start over again. So we're going back to Kip Karmick, uh, who was posted one year ago. At a final walkthrough a few hours before the closing, a water pipe was leaking and damaging the floor below. I represented the sellers and explained that since it happened before closing while in their possession, they needed to take care of it even though the house was being marketed as is, sold as is. It wasn't a bad leak, and I didn't think it would be too expensive to fix, maybe a few hundred at most. The husband absolutely lost it when he arrived and was yelling so much he had to go outside. His wife was more calm, but also didn't care that it happened while they owned it. They blamed the home inspector for loosening the pipes a few weeks ago. Our state uses attorneys to close, and their attorney was the second person that I called. She agreed, told with me, told the owners the same thing that they didn't, but they didn't care. I saw the husband literally jumping up and down like a little toddler, throwing a fit while he yelled into the phone, it's sold as is, sold as is. FYI, this is a cop who couldn't control himself. That doesn't matter. The cop part doesn't matter. In the end, we closed on time by the attorneys holding on to $1,500 in escrow until it was fixed. It was $120 because of the urgency, and I watched the guy fix it in less than an hour. Those clients wrote me a bad review on Redfin, and my managers had to have a talk with me about it, even though I had told him the full story already. In reviews less than stellar, we'll have a Redfin manager look at it over, and even though he agreed with me, he had to talk about what I could have done better. That bad review cost me like $400. There's a few things on this one. One, unless you absolutely have to market a home as is, it's just not a good idea, because there's a lot of the times that you can tell people, look, we're not planning on making any fixes, but if somebody asks you to make $300 in fixes so that you can sell your $400,000 uh, home, you know, I really feel like there's probably worth it to just be listening to all offers. And then next, uh, people freaking out about a couple hundred dollars on multi hundred thousand dollar deals is super common in real estate. People, one, have a huge emotional attachment to their home or the situation, and it is really hard for them to go through this and have somebody either critique or, or problems to arise in general. I could tell you that a really good real estate agent helps with this, but the truth of it is, is it's a hugely stressful time. It's going to be stressful for a lot of people in general because there's going to be hard things that happen and they have to get through it. This guy acting kind of like a kid and, you know, complaining about a $200 repair. I mean, you kind of wonder, maybe they don't have any money. Maybe they don't have $200. You'd be surprised at how many people have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity on their home but have no money in their bank account. Um... I sold a house that the people bought the home in like 2019. Um, they went into default in like 2021 or something right before the coronavirus. And then the coronavirus made it so that they couldn't be ejected out of their house. And they they got a hold of me one month before the bank was going to file a foreclosure on them. And they it turned out they hadn't made a single payment on the house since they bought the house for like two or three years or whatever it was. But they made $100,000 in equity. And so they, they paid their late fees and then they left the house the $100,000 even though they didn't make one payment. So it, it would surprise you the craziness that you see in real estate and that a couple hundred bucks to some people is a lot of money. But... That all doesn't matter. This situation's crazy, and it's silly that somebody wouldn't just, you know, make those small repairs. You could even almost make those repairs yourself, probably. There's a lot of repairs I see on homes that I could have done myself. But we'll keep on trucking. Now we're going to the first buyer story. Mm. This, ha this is a first buyer story, Finn Geis, one year ago. When we were house shopping, it was darn near impossible to get a contract on a house unless you made an offer the same day as opening. 
Well, we found a flip that looked nice, had its quirks, but all in all was in good condition. We started the buying process and had an inspector come out and do a walkthrough. They found mold in the basement, and so we immediately had the owner fix that, as well as an oil tank buried in the front yard that cost them $15,000 to remove. <laughs> Fast forward to the day, so oil, there's oil furnaces. I just saw one up in Downey, Idaho, and it's like common in that town, I guess, and it's basically a furnace that runs off oil. It's super old school technology. Well, this thing was from 2020. It's super old school to people who would want to use it, and it's not near as efficient as a natural gas furnace, but it doesn't matter. Fast forward to the day before closing and we were doing our final walkthrough. A bad storm came through that afternoon and the basement flooded like bad. A full two inches of water. No wonder they had mold down there. The flippers refused to fix it, replace carpet again, replace drywall again, because they had already dropped a ton of money to fix the previous issues. So we ended up walking away from that house. It sucked because we already sold our condo and my wife was six months pregnant. Oof. We had to move in with her mother temporarily until we found a new house. Now, whenever a big storm ro rose through, my wife and I look at each other and say, thank God we never got that that other house. We would have been dealing with issues for years. Uh, I know that feeling. That Me and my wife have backed out of two contracts that we had for flips, and the first one we wouldn't have made money on. I look at how much the market crashed after we bailed out of that house. And, then, and there was a better opportunity that popped up later. And then two, the second one we backed out of just because it wasn't that we were going to lose money, but we couldn't guarantee that we were going to make money. And I can agree with you that it's worth spending so much extra money to do inspections. And it's worth trying to go over there when you a large rain or snow or, or a lot of water is around the house. Because that will tell you a lot of answers about the house when it has a huge rainstorm around it, just 100% every single time. We spent like 1100 bucks on our inspection, um, and it was worth every penny because we know everything. You know, We know that we've got a little bit of a belly in our sewer line that we got to get replaced next year. Uh, we knew that the vent going in the attic, or the vent for the bathroom vent was going straight into the attic instead of going outside, so we got that fixed. But all that stuff doesn't matter as much. This is really hard. It's hard for the flippers as well, though, because the truth of it is that they probably didn't even realize that the home flooded at all. What you should typically do is make sure on the outer walls it looks like the soil is going away from your house. It makes it so that you can't have water pooling right next to it and then seeping down your walls, and that that, that slope pushes water away from your house. Uh, it's one of the biggest things that I advise my clients to always be looking for. But... There you go, Sven, guys. And so let's go to the next one. Um, I don't know why I did that so loud, but I did. Okay. Um, our real estate horror stories in Nova. This is posted by E231IKN one year ago. With the housing market being what it is, I'll get started with two from both sides of buying and selling. Former co-worker had foundation damage and toxic mold 70 times, yes, 70 times the EPA limit. So the 70 times, that seems like it's this outrageous, crazy thing, but it'd be like, so meth, you can have one, less than one microgram per 100 cubic centimeters in your house or something like that. And that's enough that you could have a baby lick on the floor and they probably wouldn't get any meth in their system. And so 70 micrograms of meth per 100 cubic centimeters is a fair amount. This is just using an example. That's 70 times more than the EPA limit. But that would be like somebody smoking meth, or like that would, you could almost get that much with people just smoking meth and then coming in the house and then it spreading through the HVAC and stuff like that. Um, 70 micrograms is a lot, but it's not an extreme amount. An extreme amount would be like 250 micrograms or something like that. And so anytime somebody says it's 70 times more than the EPA limit, it is, but that's because the EPA limit is super low to make sure that nobody can get damaged. And probably that amount of mold can be remediated with gas or even just fairly easily. I'm not trying to downplay it, but understand it in a deeper level. But let's keep going. The previous owner put some new drywall over the damage and sold the house. So that is a problem. <laughs> the new owner tore the walls out and found all the hidden damage. You can't remove walls during the regular home inspection. They don't do destruction inspections at all. Now they're suing for 800000 for will for concealment of material defect, and it's been dragging on for three years. I'm no structural engineer, but if there's a giant 10-foot hole in your concrete foundation, there's probably something wrong. The crappy part is the previous owner already said that they even... That even if they lose, they'll appeal it forever until the new owner runs out of money. And if it makes it to the Supreme Court, he'll liquidate all his assets and file bankruptcy, so he'll never have to pay 
playbook of the rich. There's some inconsistencies in this story, but there are some very valid points as well. People concealing stuff about their house is, it's not a no-no, it's illegal. You will get in trouble for it, and people can sue you and come after you for it. Let's say if I open up this wall here, and it looks like somebody painted over mold, I could go after the previous owners for that. And I could go for damages, and I would win that court case. You would imagine I would win that court case. Um, even, But people even going on appeal, it's not like it would make it up to the Supreme Court. There's a lot of this stuff that, it's not like the court's going to accept every case, so it's a lot more complicated than that. That's the problem with a lot of these stories, is they take these... You know, 70 times the mold, and it's going to go up to the Supreme Court. They use these really extreme examples that there's some truth to, but the bigger things in this are the home had too much mold in it, and it needed to be remediated, that there was the sellers had hidden problems with the home, and there need to be repercussions from that. You know, it sounds much more boring when I say you need to make sure you remediate mold, and that the sellers lied, and that they need to go to court, and that they need to pay a price for them lying about that. It's a lot less energetic than me saying mold was 70 times higher than what the EPA allows and that the Supreme Court, they'll, they're going to sue them and play book the rich and do all of that. I'm not trying to go out for or against anybody, but just something to kind of... A lot of real estate is people making everything seem impossible and scary when there's really simple solutions to a lot of it. Although this is an extreme example, people hiding stuff's terrible, they need to be doing something. But let's go to the second story. My distant family members hired unlicensed, unlicensed contractor to remodel his house and sold it. It collapsed on the new owner. Insurance came out and found all the unpermitted work that caused the collapse. They're suing both him and his wife and the contractor for the cost of the house plus $500,000. Going on two years now, they're pretty close to settling, and there's criminal charges pending for unpermitted construction, zoning violation, and unlicensed contractor. I guess the county can give up to one year to make reparations before they file criminal charges. <laughs> they said all the licensed contractors wanted over $100,000 for the work. I bet that seems a lot cheaper now. They are extremely lucky that no one was in the home when it collapsed. The fire marshal said somebody could have easily been killed if they were there. So this is a very legitimate problem. A lot of people do want to go as cheap as possible. They don't want to pay for inspections. They want to hire cheap contractors without realizing that a lot of the extra red tape that people have with being a contractor is good. Like construction workers should have insurance to make sure that if their work's incorrect, that there's some way that they're able to pay for that through insurance. And they also need to be held to a standard of you trying to get a permit through the city and the city says you you look you have to make sure that there is um what is it firewall that goes between the the or between the main story and the basement so that if a fire starts in the basement it can't travel up to the ceiling you have to have the correct kind of wiring and ground wiring for your electrical your electrical box needs to not be so far from a uh, tree these are all safety things, and so people are unlicensed or don't get permits for it. They don't have to follow those things, which makes it cheaper, but also makes it much more dangerous. So I, I understand people not wanting to spend money, but there's a huge piece of it that you spend a little extra money for the safety, the consistency, and the insurance. Um, but also that's a really hard thing in general. I feel really bad for those people. But well, we're going. We'll keep on trucking the next story because these are, these are kind of rough, some of them. Okay, Crosby. Um, 11 years ago, this guy posted, we're in the process of buying a house and the seller's agent decided to go on a week-long cruise in the middle of our inspection period. No phone, no email, and she didn't hand it off to the other agent in her office. Our inspection period is scheduled to end the day she gets back. Awesome. This is, so this is, un, this is just unprofessional. This is real estate agents who either haven't had a normal job or, or don't understand how to be professional or don't care about their clients as maybe as much as I feel like they should not making a plan for it. This sucks, but also they chose to use this agent. It's a hard middle ground on. Everybody really wants to hate real estate agents, but people keep using terrible real estate agents. And so real estate agents aren't going to get better until people start holding them accountable. And holding them more accountable than, um, you know how you hold an agent accountable? You either make it so they have to pay for their mistakes or you stop using them. Either one of those things affects their, their checkbook. Not saying you should or shouldn't do that, but I personally am sick of people complaining about real estate agents and then continually using the cheapest um, real estate agents or using agents that aren't very good. But side note, doesn't really matter. Go to the next one. Um, this one is deleted, but it was posted nine months ago, or the author was deleted. My experience is the young real estate agents are good in that they are more available, but they are not good negotiators. 
experienced real estate agents may not be as available, but they're better at getting the deal closed. This is 100% correct. Like even that mold thing that somebody's talking about soon earlier, there's a lot of new agents that'll be there and experience it. Be like, oh my goodness, mold is so scary. And, and they'll jump on the emotions of the buyer and say, you should be scared of mold. I'm scared of mold. But you'll have a lot of experienced agents that say that don't look at it as, you know, mold is going to kill you. They look at it as that mold remediation is going to cost probably around $500 to $600 to get it clean to the safe level that's required to make it so that your family can move in there safely. And so they look at those things differently. And that's where old agents all of a sudden will go, you know, mold is something you should be 100% scared of, but they'll assess the situation. Is it one block of mold that's on a piece of drywall that you can cut out, put a new piece of drywall in? Is it a bunch of mold that you have to miss to clean? Is it so much mold that it's, it's irreparable, that you need to not buy that house at all? But they'll be able to assess that or have the ability to talk to people who can assess it better than a newer agent who will get emotional and scared about it. Um, the negotiation, everything's negotiable with real estate agents. And I think that people, that's why you try not to sell your home and say it's as is. It's because it's one of those things, like if somebody really wants to buy your house and they just want $5,000 in seller paid concessions, um, and they'll still buy your house as is, but they want those seller paid concessions, like that's probably worth it in some scenarios. But um, that's all I got on that one. Let's go to, I think we only got one. We got the last one. Uh, last one of my, <laughs> this camera's heating up again. This one is funny. I had a client buying a kind of hippie mini farm. And one of the features was a full on tree house with kitchen electricity. Wow. That's cool. One of the borrowers planned to do her reiki business in there. Cool. The family facility, the bathroom facility allocated to the tree house was an outhouse. Also fine. Whatever. Buyer's agent is going to be out of town the day they ended up wanting to close and ask another agent to cover the walkthrough for them. Other agent takes immense pride in her work and is extremely thorough and was going to make sure that she reported every single defect on that house with photos and in detail. Good. I know both these agents well. So the day of the final walkthrough comes around, my documents are at the attorney and I get a huge panicked phone call from the agent who did the walkthrough with them. The outhouse has... <laughs> the outhouse has a turd in it a huge massive turd she has taken a photo of this and calls me asking if that's a health hazard that prevents me from being able to fund the loan and ask what she needs to do about telling the other agent does she just include it in the pictures video nonchalantly does she warn the other agent she should should she just not include the photos even though she documented everything else i laughed so hard buyers didn't care at all and so we followed their lead this is one of those things that uh, you got to maybe assume this guy's maybe a newer agent, but also maybe not. I, I've never worked with an outhouse before. If I saw a big old turd in an outhouse, I'd figure that I'd be like, well, what what do you do? And, I, and I'd have to see the pictures and understand like what the context of the situation was. Uh, but this is just a funny one. And this is one of those things that like, you know, it's a random thing you wouldn't really expect to happen that does happen. Um, <laughs> what do you do if somebody's using your outhouse before you moved in? And it didn't look like somebody had been before that. So, I don't know. Just funny. Just a funny last one for you there. But, there you go. There's the stories that I wanted to had today. I really would. If anybody has any stories, please email them to me. PaytonFairbanks at gmail.com. Text me. Whatever. If you don't anybody, know anybody looking to buy or sell a house, I really appreciate you bringing up my name. Other than that, thanks for watching. Stay, stay warm this winter. Make sure that you're starting to get your stuff ready for the winter because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a hard one, I really think. A cold, wet one and a lot of snow. Uh, but I appreciate you watching. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day and bye-bye now.